Hello again, welcome to the James C. Reviews. Today we're looking at the fourth film from my all-time favorite filmmaker, Quentin Tarantino. That's right, today I'm going to be reviewing Kill Bill Volume 1. Don't you ever wake up. No! It's been a while since I looked at a Tarantino film. I couldn't get to one last year due to trying to get my 100th episode just right, but that's taken care of, so let's jump into it. Kill Bill Volume 1 was the first film by Quentin Tarantino to come out in six years after his amazing and possibly greatest film, Jackie Brown. And this was actually a big passion project for Tarantino. This film had been in development pretty much since Pulp Fiction came out. Many things went to the inspiration of this movie. One being, obviously, Tarantino's love of 1970s films, kung fu films, grindhouse films. And also, after working with Uma Thurman on Pulp Fiction, he wanted to give her a big vehicle to star in, and he wrote the film while spending time with her, and the film's credits, the character of the bride, is credited to Q and Mew. Get it? Uh, I don't know, um, yeah? Another big inspiration was seeing Uma Thurman interact with her at the time, newborn daughter, and just seeing how she was as a mother. And to get an idea of just how long Tarantino spent perfecting the script for this movie, Robert Rodriguez revealed that he had a videotape he had filmed of Quentin reading like an early draft of the script to him way back in the mid-90s. I've killed 18 men in the last week. Didn't feel a thing. <laughs> Those 18 dead bodies were just 18 steps. The plot for Kill Bill centers around a character who in the first film is simply known as The Bride, played by Uma Thurman. After opening with the oh-so-classic Grindhouse intro and a funny little Star Trek tribute, the movie opens with the bride lying on the floor of a church, all bloodied and bruised and just beaten, and we hear someone walking up to her, who then wipes her face with a handkerchief with the word Bill on it. Do you find me sadistic? I'll bet I could fry an egg on your head right now tries to make sense or some justification of everything that has just happened. And then he pulls out a gun and says, This is me and my most masochistic. And while dealing with a huge amount of pain, the bride grits out, Bill, it's your baby. <laughs> And then we get a awesome opening credit sequence playing under Nancy Sinatra's Bang Bang. He shot me down, bang bang, I hit the ground, bang bang. And before I move on with the plot, originally Kill Bill was going to be one long ass film. And combining volume one with volume two, that would have made the film over four fucking hours. Tarantino split Kill Bill into two parts after being encouraged to do so by Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Yo! Say what you will about the asshole, but you can't deny that was probably a decision for the best. And yes, I will address, there is a little bit of awkwardness seeing Harvey Weinstein's name in the credits of this film about a woman getting revenge against her attackers. And my main thought, along with any film that Harvey Weinstein and his brother Bob Weinstein produced, is it does not impact the film at all. I mean, to seeing the Weinsteins' names on Goodwill Hunting, the early films of Kevin Smith, the films of Robert Rodriguez, including probably many people's childhood favorite Spy Kids, affect those movies or the enjoyment they gave you? I certainly hope not. At the end of the day, they were just the executive producers. It's the damn money, men. You never know who's a windbag and who's got the goods. To me, it doesn't really matter. Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2 have been, are, and will always be kick-ass motherfucking movies with some pretty strong badass female leads. After the film's brutal opening scene, which was partially Uma Thurman's idea, she came up with the opening shot, this film continues Tarantino's early film tradition of playing series of events out of order. 
and also having the film play in chaptered segments. Chapter 1, 2. We see the bride over four years later, much more healed now, entering Pasadena, California, and stopping at a suburban home that seems pretty quiet. She goes up and is answered by Vivica A. Fox playing Vernita Green. Sarah, I cannot believe you are early. <laughs> And then a very brutal and inventive fight scene happens, where the two of them fight in this little home, using everything they can find, furniture, uh, kitchen utensils, anything. And what makes this scene pretty cool is, well yes, they get up from their injuries. You can tell it hurts, and when they get hit, they don't bounce back right away. They take a few seconds, like, just to suck it in, walk it off. It feels like a very real, um, painful fight. Come on, bitch. After they both get a knife and find themselves on even ground, a school bus pulls up. Bernita looks at the bride, showing a bit of desperation, and in a funny moment... Mommy, I'm home. Hey, baby. How was school? Her daughter, whose name is Nikki, looks a little freaked out, but because there's no immediate danger going on, she doesn't spaz out, and while this kid doesn't have anything deeply major to do, the way she acts um, feels a bit believable as far as how a little kid might react seeing such a mess and seeing her mom and this other person she's never seen before look all bruised. Um, Mr. Sims, how old are you, Nikki? Nikki? Just asked you a question. And because, I guess, Tarantino wanted to keep the bride's name a mystery until he thought it was appropriate, every time the character or another utters her name, it's bleeped out. That sounds f***ing stupid. Ah, what the hell was that? And Vernita, trying to remain calm for her kid, tells her to go upstairs. So you can go in your room now, and I want you to leave us alone until I tell you to come out. Okay? Nakia! In your room. After getting her daughter to leave, it seems that Vernita and the bride reach a temporary truce. And, well, this is pretty cool. Tarantino, he's one of the few film writers, directors who could pull this kind of thing off. After really trying to kill each other and just destroying the house, they take a break and she asks, You want some coffee? Yeah. It's interesting and cool because you know what these characters are thinking. The bride wants to kill her, but doesn't want to do it around her kid. And Vernita, understanding that she won't hurt her at this particular moment, tries to take advantage of this brief truce. You have every right to want to get even. To get even, I would have to kill you. Go up to Nikki's room, kill her. Then wait for your husband, the good Dr. Bell, to come home and kill him. And Renita, after seeing that she can't appease her, agrees to a showdown. You and I have unfinished business. So when do we do this? When do you want to die? How about tonight, bitch? Splendid. But in true Tarantino fashion, it does not go how you expect. They continue making small talk, just uh, reminiscing, and it's unclear just how close they were back in the day. This Pasadena homemaker's name is Jeannie Bell. But back when we were acquainted four years ago, her name was Vernita Green. Her code name was Copperhead. Mine, Black Mamba. Well, they talk, while well, there is hostility and a sense of immediate danger. <laughs> Black Mamba. <laughs> I should have been motherfucking Black Mamba. You also feel some, what almost feels like genuine warmness, just because they did know each other for a while. Weapon of choice, if you want to stick with your butcher knife, that's fine with me. Very funny, bitch. And then... Very funny, bitch! It's pretty fast and completely catches you off guard, and despite a potential buildup, it was not disappointing in the least. It's dark, bloody, and sad.
And I'm not sure how realistic it is that this kid wouldn't break down crying, but her mom is an ex-assassin, and while she may have been avoiding that life, maybe she taught her daughter to be tough, or maybe she's just in shock. And the bride, who you can tell, has a little bit of sympathy for the kid. It's not my intention to do this in front of you. For that, I'm sorry. But you can take my word for it. Your mother had it coming. And being where she is now, after the apparent murder of her baby, anticipates that someday she and Nikki might meet again. When you grow up, if you still feel raw about it, I'll be waiting. Nice little homage to the 1989 Punisher. You're a good boy, Tommy. Grow up to be a good man. Because if not, I'll be waiting. After that, we see the bride get in her truck, and before grabbing her death list, she briefly looks at the camera and this look of just horror and sadness says a lot. All the while, we get a narration saying that if you are off for revenge, do not let emotion get in the way. Cut down anyone who stands in your path, even if that be God or Buddha themself. The bride then drives off, and we see that her truck has on the back pussy wagon. It makes sense later. After that, we start Chapter 2, The Blood Splattered Bride. We go back over four years to the day that Bill tried to kill the bride, and we see not only her, but everybody's dead, and the local authorities in the town of El Paso, Texas, investigate. The main person in charge being Texas Ranger Earl McGraw, played by the late, great Michael Parks. Reprising his role from the Tarantino-written, Robert Rodriguez-directed, From Dust Till Dawn. Despite the fact that his character got killed in the opening scene of that movie, I guess Tarantino decided this character, and Michael Parks for that matter, was just too good to use only once. And who knows when From Dust Till Dawn took place. But then again, this character was also featured in a movie where zombies took over the world, so... Who knows what the fuck universe this movie takes place in. Earl McGraw walks in with his deputy slash son, who he calls son number one. Give me the gore details, son number one. It's a goddamn massacre, Pop. Played by Michael Park's actual son, James Parks. What'd I tell you, Pop? It's like a goddamn Nicaraguan death squad. That shit can and grass me, boy. They walk through the church, Earl McGraw looks over and gains a theory of what happened. This ain't no squirrely amateur. This is the work of a solid dog. You can tell by the cleanliness and carnage. Now, to kill crazy rampage, though it may be, all the colors are kept inside the iron. If you was a moron, you could almost be married. Then he gets a look at the bride, and even with eyes swollen up and blood dripping out of five, ten different spots on her face, he is uh, intoxicated by her beauty. Man, it'd be a mad dog. She'd a goddamn good looking gal like that in the head. She's a blood spattered angel. And he says, once again, after scolding his kid for saying, God damn. It's a tall drinker. Cocksucker ain't dead. Then we got to some time later where we see the bride, now all healed but in a coma. The name that she had on her wedding certificate was found out to be false, so she's now known as a Jane Doe. Keeping her name a mystery, as the bride lays in the hospital, we see a woman come in, whistling the tune of Twisted Nerve by Bernard Herrmann. And I don't know if that was really her whistling it, but it's possible. I had a friend of sorts in high school who was perfectly able to whistle Twisted Nerve, and it was pretty impressive. Back to the film. 
this new mysterious woman finds a room and changes into a stereotypical nurse's outfit. All the while, there's a split screen going on, showing the comatose bride, while this woman takes a red liquid into a syringe, and then comes out and, <laughs> this is just uh, funny, she's wearing an eye patch that has a red cross over it. And we find out this is another member of the Deadly Viper Assassination Squad. Ellie Driver, played by Daryl Hannah. Once at the bride's room, the split screen goes away. Being one of many tributes that Tarantino pays to one of his all-time favorite directors, Brian De Palma, Ellie goes up to the bride, makes sure that she's really in a coma. I might never have liked you, or in fact I despise you, but that shouldn't suggest that I don't respect you. And in a very evil and condescending tone, says dying in our sleep is a luxury so little can afford. As she's about to inject, she gets a call on her cell from Bill, whose face has yet to be revealed. Hello, Bill. What's her condition? Bill is played by the star of the last movie I reviewed on the show, David Carradine. Where is she? I'm standing over her right now. Bill, from what we've seen of him, is a powerful criminal. It's unclear if he's a boss of some organization, if he just runs a group of assassins, and he seems very into the Asian cultures. He tells Ellie, who is apparently his uh, bitch on the go. Ellie, you're going to abort the mission. <laughs> Which does not please Ellie in the slightest. Oh, you don't owe her shit! Will you keep your voice down? You don't owe her shit! To which Bill says he feels killing the bride in her current state, that it would lower them. But one thing we won't do is sneak into her room in the night like a filthy rat and kill her in her sleep. And Ellie, not wanting to piss Bill off, concedes. Come on home. Affirmative. I love you very much. I love you too. Fun fact, Quentin Tarantino originally wrote the character of Bill as a more suave James Bond type. And when he was still planning to go that route with the character, he offered the role to Warren Beatty, who, while he turned down the role, was actually the one who suggested to Tarantino that he cast David Carradine. Wonderful! And before leaving, she says, you probably thought that was very funny, huh, shithead? Word of advice, never wake up. Cut to four years later. The bride is still in a coma, and after a mosquito lands on her and sucks a little blood... This moment... The bride jerks awake and is bombarded with flashbacks. It's your lady. She then feels her head, there's a metal plate, feels her stomach, and... <laughs> It'd be almost impossible not to get emotional seeing her cry during this. <laughs> then she hears a noise, quickly falls down, playing dead, not sure what to expect. And we see this nurse come in, played by Michael Bowen, returning from Jackie Brown, and fun fact, while Michael Bowen and David Carradine are not related, they share three brothers through various parents getting married and divorced. Anyway, Michael Bowen as Buck shows up with a trucker, played by Jonathan Lagren. How about the time he tackled a guy from Louisville and threw him into the stands? <laughs> <laughs> and what he says next is a pretty fucking sick and twisted thing to hear. Price is $75 a fuck, my friend. You getting your freak on or what? Oh, yeah, boy. Ugh, God. Rule number one, no punching. Nurse comes in tomorrow and she got her shiner and less than teeth jigs up. And by the way, this little cunt's a spitter. It's a motor reflex thing. But spitter, no, no punching. 
So yeah, this nurse is a rapist, and he pimps out the comatose patients to other rapists. Her plumbing down there don't work no more, so feel free to come in her all you want. I'll be back in 20. <laughs> God, that's graphic. Hmm. So after getting paid and throwing the guy a little tub of Vaseline because Tarantino hates product placement, the trucker rapist gets on top of the bride, we cut away, and then we hear just one of the most uh, chilling screams of agony you'll ever hear. <coughs> she quickly tries to get out, but finds her legs can't work. Obviously, after being in a coma for four years. After quickly making sure she's awake and getting the trucker's knife, she hides, Buck comes back, and... Hey, buddy, did you have yourself a good time, man? And as he stands there looking like a dumb cunt, the camera pans down slowly with a complete horror-sounding theme. Showing, while not very shocking, the bride. <laughs> With all her strength, drags him to the door, puts his head between it, and just slams repeatedly, screaming, Where's Bill? <laughs> Where's Bill? And, while pretty intense, also has a few moments for some humor. Please stop hitting me. Where's Bill? <laughs> I don't know who Bill is. Bullshit! <laughs> but then she looks at his name tag, his knuckle, which has the word fuck tattooed over it, and she has vivid flashbacks to when she was in the coma and remembers that Buck is a nurse who came in regularly and would rape her. Well, ain't you the slice of cutie pie they said you were? <laughs> the main thing that sticks out is the first time he appeared and said, My name is Buck, and I'm here to fuck. Which is a tribute to Robert Englund's signature line in Toby Hooper's Ian Alive. Name's Buck. I'm raring to fuck. And taking in this new disturbing info, the bride looks down at Buck with a look of just building rage. Your name is Buck, and you came here to fuck, right? And admittedly, this section of the film, this little side plot, does not connect to the rest of the film, but it is still very satisfying to watch. Even if she's the victim, she kicks. No, she obliterates ass. And in an escape that's very similar to the Steven Seagal movie, Hard to Kill, which is also about somebody waking up from a coma, she finds Buck's truck, which she identifies by his keychain. I said the truck would make sense later. The bride gets in the truck, still not able to move her legs. She stares at her feet and just says over and over, Making herself comfortable. Wiggle your big toe. Wiggle your big toe. And as she lies there trying to get her toe to move, the bride's narration kicks in, and she talks about the very first person she'll be going after on her revenge quest, Oren Ishii, a.k.a. Cottonmouth, played by Lucy Liu. And then we enter my favorite part of the film. Chapter 3. The origin of O Ren. This entire chapter, sans a brief scene with the bride at the end, is told in anime form. And just to be clear, I am not an anime fan. I don't hate anime, but I haven't seen enough to really have much of an opinion on it. But despite that, this whole section, which is told in anime form, is just incredible. It gives a lot of backstory to what is the film's most focused on antagonist. The half-Japanese, half-Chinese American army brat made her first acquaintance with death at the age of nine. Originally the character was going to be just Japanese and Tarantino was looking for a Japanese actress but after seeing Lucy Liu in Shanghai Noon, of all things, he specifically had the character rewritten as Chinese-Japanese-American. 
and we see Oren, age nine, hiding under a bed as her father is brutally killed by the henchmen of Yakuza boss Matsumoto. <laughs> never been verified, a strong fan theory that was supported by the late David Carradine is that the particular henchman who kills Oren's father could be a younger version of Bill. The main thing that implies it is the rings on his fingers, similar to the ones Bill has in his current age. And facial feature-wise, I do see a few similarities, but there's not enough to like fully verify it. Interestingly, this is the only instance in either of the Kill Bill films where a male character is killed by another man. And then we see Boss Matsumoto personally kill Oren's mother in the most psychotic looking kill of the film. <laughs> As she silently cries, the blood from her mother seeps through the bed and drips all over her. And to me, this is the most powerful moment in Kill Bill Volume 1. First few times I watched this movie, this scene always managed to create some kind of teariness in my eyes and watching it again today it still gives me the chills and creates a good deal of sympathy for this character who we still want to see and will inevitably die later on. And then the henchman, who might be a young Bill, sets the whole place ablaze as they leave. Oren manages to sneak out and the bride says that she swore revenge. Luckily for her, boss Matsumoto was a pedophile. So yeah, as if we didn't have enough reason to hate this motherfucker. This makes his death scene all the more satisfying. At 11, she got her revenge. And as she twists the blade in him, he grits on his teeth so hard that they pop out of his mouth. <laughs> she asks if he recognizes her as someone he killed. And then after letting geysers of blood shoot out, and killing Matsumoto's uh, goons. We cut to nine years later, still in anime form. By 20, she was one of the top female assassins in the world. Oren, in a very cool looking red jumpsuit, takes a sniper rifle and is able to kill a target while he's inside a limo. And we see an awesome shot of the bullet going through his brain out the other end and See through the hole in his head. And after this amazingly well done backstory chapter, we cut back to the bride still in the pussy wagon, trying to get her big toe to move. She manages. Let's get these other piggies wiggling. Cut to 13 hours later, and it's a tribute to cheesy exploitation kung fu films, so we can overlook the fact that she's apparently been there that long, and no one has noticed uh, the two dead bodies she left behind. Nobody will ever notice that. Filmmaking is not about the tiny details, it's about the big picture. She sets out, getting the tools necessary for her revenge quest. And so we begin Chapter 4, The Man from Okinawa. Heading to the little island of Okinawa, Japan, the bride taking on the persona of a young, pretty uh, female tourist goes to a sushi shop run by a guy played by cult kung fu icon Sony Chiba, star of the Street Fighter. <laughs> The bride chats it up in the sushi shop, putting on this uh, young, cutesy, dumb, blonde girl persona, which admittedly is the cringiest part of the film, but it's supposed to be. Can you speak Japanese? No, no, just a few words I learned since yesterday. She gives a few words, and he teaches her how to say them correctly. Konnichiwa? Ah, 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 ah. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. 
After a funny little argument with the only other worker in this sushi joint, known as the bald guy, played by Kenji Oba. The sushi chef asks the bride what brings her to Okinawa. She says she's looking for a man who she's never met before. When asked who he is, she says, this causes the man, who, no shock, is Hattori Hanzo, to drop what he's holding and just stare at the bride in complete shock and curious, asks what she wants with him. And we then find out that Hattori Hanzo is a sword maker, and he made swords many years ago for Bill and his associates. He shows the bride many swords he has on display, and the scene of the bride seeing all these swords is just so well done. Like, you feel, you, we the audience, feel exactly what the character is supposed to feel, which is just awe, amazement, and admiration. And after allowing her to take one sword down, Hanzo says, Funny you like samurai swords. I like baseball. They actually did that for real. And it was done by Uma Thurman's stunt double, Zoe Bell, an amazing stunt woman who would later have a major acting role in Tarantino's film Death Proof. Just imagine what would have happened if she didn't move that sword fast enough. <laughs> Zoe Bell reportedly injured her back while filming, but didn't say anything because she didn't want to lose the job. Never give up, never surrender. After being impressed by the, what the bride is able to do, Hattori Hanzo takes the sword back and he says, Surely you must know that he is retired. She says, starting to get on edge, she needs one of his swords and tells him to give her one, saying the person she wants to kill is a former student of his. And suddenly driven by this new information, Hanzo says he will make the sword, and it'll take him a month to do so. We see them in traditional Japanese robes, and looking at the sword, he says no ego plays in this. It is the best one he has ever made and talks about how he swore a blood oath to God 28 years ago that he would never make another katana. And he tells the bride in a very philosophical way that should she come across God, God will be cut. And in a way that I find kind of touching, calls her yellow-haired warrior. <laughs> The Man from Okinawa is the least violent of the five chapters in Kill Bill Volume 1. It's all about the scenery and building up some ambiguous mystery for the character of Bill. And Sony Chiba does a great job here for this small but more than a cameo part. He has a good amount of dialogue, but at the same time, a lot of the pain and anger he has is all in the eyes. The whole chapter is just beautiful. There's no other word I can use to describe it. And seeing what the bride looks over the swords is just, it's amazing. And and so concludes part one of my review of Kill Bill Volume 1. Part two will be coming very soon where I talk about Chapter 5, and this is where things just go nuts and shit just starts bouncing off the walls. Literally. <laughs>
And when I get to where I'm going, about 20 minutes from now, I'm going to kill Bill. <laughs> 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 then, then the music, then the uh, oh, yeah, title oh, song shit. begins.